<laughs> we, what are we, three weeks into this series? Um, we are talking about the talents this morning. We had a great, we've had a great weekend. We had Friday night in the midst of a holiday weekend, we had our worship night where, where we experienced people that, that, that got healed, um, people that were refreshed and restored. So yesterday we, we, we had here not only a, a women's Spanish um, event, but then at two o'clock we honored uh, we, we brought in, and because we support uh, exterior ministries, not just about 23, and so I was able to sit with some other people of this church and some other people and hear a, a dear friend share her heart about her college ministry and how we can support it. And so it's, it's, it's a full, full plate, and, and I found myself over the last few weeks asking a very simple question to our ministry leaders. And I've talked to our kids department and our youth department and our worship team. And I've talked to our, 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 our campus pastors. Because one of the things that God has continually asked me over the last few months is, what have I called you to do? What have I put in your heart? What dream have I, have I placed in your heart? that you want to accomplish. You see, in church life and in honest everyday life, at times we live to exist, right? We live to just kind of be there and, and hang out, and yet with all my heart, I know that God has called us, each one of us, to something greater and something more. And, and the tension is to live while we're living in this world and while we punch a time clock while we pay the bills, while we deal with the 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 day-to-day -day grind of our life, that we interact and we wrestle with what God has placed on our hearts. You see, and those are two different things at times. And and this morning, I kind of want to, if I could ask every single person here, this is what I would ask you. I would ask you not what your struggle is. I would ask you not how I could pray for you or what you need help with. What I would ask you is what God has called you to. You see, that's a different kind of conversation. That's a conversation that transcends the immediate, but affects the immediate. That's a conversation that opens us up to possibilities that we don't think we have. You see, because if we can grasp and define and articulate the heart of God for our lives, and we believe that he called us to something greater than just simply existing. Then the area that we live in, the communities that we call home, the work that we do, this very region would change. Because the body of Christ, maybe for the first time in 23's history, this local church would believe that they are not only called, but they are equipped to do good works. And if they believed, they being you, believed that you were not only called to do good works, but that you were equipped to do those good works, then life would become such a rich adventure to be pursued rather than endured. And I don't care how old you are or how young you are. I don't care how much history or how much water's flown under the bridge you call home. Every single person here that's breathing, whether you are in middle school, whether you are a graduate of high school, whether you are still in college or finally got out of that place, whether you are climbing the corporate ladder, whether you are turning wrenches or digging ditches, and hear me, some of my dearest friends, even if you are retired, I don't know how to break this to you. <laughs> if you are still taking a breath, and I'm pretty sure there's no dead people here this morning, <laughs> you still have a call of God on your heart. God has called you to something more. And not only has he called you, but he'll equip you. 
So there's a parable in Scripture that Jesus says in Matthew 25. Where he says that for it, it being the kingdom of God. Remember we talked about that last week. The kingdom of God is a, is a, is a kingdom that is, that is beyond and larger and more opportunistic than the, than the world in which we call home. It is a kingdom that's not only in heaven, but as we have been taught, that we pray that that kingdom comes here on earth. And when it comes here on earth, it's like a man, for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. Everybody say entrust. Entrust is to give control over to. Entrust is to give control over to. Entrust is not tasking someone and lining out everything that they have to do to be a good laborer. Right? If you've ever been in a ditch, if you've ever worked a shovel, and you've had a boss that's told you how to dig a ditch, that's not entrusting. That's telling you exactly what to do. Anybody ever had a job like that? Right? If you've ever been on the bottom end of a labor scale, not the white collar guy, but the dude that's like on the smart end of a shovel. The smart end of the shovel is the handle. Those of you that's never had to have learned that lesson. Right? So I was entrusted with the smart end of the shovel. And I was told exactly what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and how hard to do it. That's not entrusting. Entrusting is to go, what have you called to do? Here's the things that I've called you to do. Here's the things that you need to do it. Go do it. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom that we pray to come is like the man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them with his property. Would it shock you to believe that God has entrusted each and every person here and we've already grounded the fact that that includes everybody that's breathing? Okay, so if you take a breath right now, okay, that's you, right? have entrusted to you with something that is his. Has trusted you with something. For some, it's money. The church is famous for ridiculing people that are wealthy, and yet wealth can do in a phenomenally amount of goodness when they live in the kingdom of God. For others, it's great talent. We saw some amazing talent here, this morning up here. For the others, it's an ability to communicate. For others, it's an ability to work with their hands. For, for some, it's an ability to strategize. Whatever that is, for some, it's a parenting. For some, it's care. For some, it's service. But God has entrusted you with something that he values. You all hear that? The gifts that you have that you sometimes feel aren't enough, or don't measure up to the person to the left or to the right of you. He has entrusted to you with those gifts and gifts that he has valued. He doesn't give you junk. He doesn't give you something that's like, oh yeah, I got something left at the bottom of the bucket. Who gets that? Oh, that's Dave's. Everything else good is left and it's been handed to Roseanne. But, but, <laughs> but the, the leftover stuff, you know, the stuff that's right on the bottom end of the scum, that, that thing that you would flush out and like, well, that's Dave's. God doesn't operate that way. Everything that God gives is good. And because it's good, it shows that he loves you so much that he entrusts something to you. You shake your tree for a little bit. I got like 19 minutes. So let me say something about relationships and marriages and children. God has entrusted you with one of his kids, one of his creation. Oh, they're a curse. No. <laughs> they are something that he values, and he believes in you enough to put them into your life. And it says, Oh, old books. That's awesome. <laughs> it says, To the one he gave five talents. You ever know someone like that? Got everything going on? Yeah, I have people like that in my life. They kind of anger me. I'm just saying. 
It's like everything kind of seems easy, right? Everything kind of like, like how can you like write and play and sing and draw? You know, how do you, how do you like are musical and artistic and you cook and you cook during the fall? You know, so, so five talent people. They gave some the five talents, another two, and another one. So the kingdom of God is like a master who, who came, called his servants together to entrust them. To one he gave five, and to another two, and to another one. And in a world like ours, we're like, well, that ain't fair. Everybody deserves a star. Participation trophies. If you're trying, you get to win. Hypothetically, okay? So as a guy that used to play a lot of sports, I honestly, I just don't get that. But in this world, the idea that we confuse equality with entitlement and we confuse the distribution with fairness. The kingdom of God isn't like that. You see, because the kingdom of God wants men and women to, to, to succeed, not to be treated equitably. Not so everybody gets a gold star. Because in the kingdom of God, he wants to have an impact in the world in which we live in, so he gives us things that we can handle. Not the things we think we deserve. Oh, bummer for that one. <laughs> I'll give you an example. So if, say you're like an 18-year-old guy that grew up in California that was called into the ministry. Hypothetically, this is just a story. It does not apply to me. 18-year-old guy called him and has no idea about that because he didn't grow up in church. I don't even know what a pastor's supposed to be and do. And so the pastor was this, this kid, this punk kid that played a lot of sports, that was okay in school, who had dreams of swimming with fish, was called in the ministry. So he finds himself in a Bible college. Now, let me help you out there. If you weren't raised in church and you show up in a Bible college, that right there is the problem. Because <laughs> you don't have the skill set or the cultural awareness to function in that world. And on top of that, I was working with the smart, hand, smart end of a shovel. So during the day, I was mastering the art of shoveling in a ditch. And at night, I would go to this Bible college. Now, every pastor should be able to sing. They actually had a class where I had to lead worship. Can you imagine the horror? I can't hit a note with a shotgun. But you're expected to have certain talents. So I should be able to play the guitar and sing. Like, what can you do, Dave? Well, I spent nine years with a helmet so I can run into things. Makes me hard-headed. I found out later hard-headedness is actually a better gift for pastoring than musical ability, but that's another story. <laughs> but he gave me what I needed. He gave you what you, you need. It says that the, the servant went, uh, the, the, the master went away, and the guy with five talents invested and turned five talents into five, and the guy with two talents invested and turned the two talents into two more, and then the guy with the one talent buried it. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at some of this, but, but I want to deal with a, a couple things. At times, we look at the other men and women around us and say, why don't I got his? When I got that talent, why do I only get this when they got so much? It's interesting that scholars will tell you that a talent in today's numbers is anywhere from 500000 to over a million dollars worth of money. And, w and what we look at is like, well, that's not fair. I mean, hey, you only got one. You got a million bucks. And, and we might crave for the, the five, but the fact is, is there's many of us that aren't able yet to handle the five. Well, that doesn't seem right. 
Well, look at the, how many lotto winners go in a ditch. Right? And so we look at that and like they got 10 million bucks and they're like poor. What did you do? They didn't have the skill sets enough to reflect on the gift that they were handed. Because the lotto doesn't care whether they succeed or not. All the lotto wants to do is convince you that if you spend your two bucks, you can get the 10 million like they got. You see, God doesn't operate that way. God gives us what we need to succeed, not what we think we need. And then it is our ability to, to make it work. And, and this parable teaches us that success is a product of our work. Everybody say work. Oh, that's just horrible. But I love what we are made to work. From Genesis on, man was created to do. It says man put God, or, or God put man in the garden to work it. Like, well, you mean I gotta have effort? Yeah, sorry. That's how we're wired. See, because that drives us and lets us not just, just simply be settling with existence that we want more. And that's not greed. That's in our DNA. That's how God made us. God made us to work, and it takes work to succeed. Second one, God gives us everything we need to be successful in what he's called us to. If we don't compare, we realize that how God has equipped us is to accomplish what he has called us to. Going back to my little story, I really don't need to be able to play the guitar because God has brought us people that can play the guitar. I don't need to do that. You see, we as the body of Christ add to each other. We are not separate entities, individuals that have to populate the entire world with our amazingness. We have strengths and we have weaknesses. In our strengths, we contribute that to the greater body of Christ. And in our weaknesses, the greater body of Christ comes up and supports us. That's why we are born into relationship. We need other people. The myth that I don't need church. Well, good luck with life. Just me and Jesus. I don't know how to tell you that, but that's not written in here. We are made to be in community with one another because we need each other to complete the body of Christ. And what's that? We're not all the same. I know that that shocks you. <laughs> Last time I get to pick on Daniel. I am grateful for Tara. Because <laughs> Tara is not like Daniel. <laughs> That's just my last parting gift, man. <laughs> right, but we look at the guy with the five and say, this is who we should be. No, we shouldn't. We should be who people guy, how God's called us. And so that is the idea. And, and, and so we, we sit there and, and we talk about these things. See, we're these, these, all this stuff. We're not all the same. And here's the kicker is that we don't work for ourselves. Man, we live in a country that is defined by its individualism. I'm, I'm taking a class in sociology and it's the last, it's the second to last class of my entire educational journey. Thank God. <laughs> But whole books are written about this nation and Western civilization and its individualistic tendencies. And there's some strength to that. But we work for another. You see, it says a master entrusted his servants with something. But then when you read the back end of the story, the master was ticked at the one because the one just did what he felt was right and the other two did what he had expected the master called to. Every call of God comes with a responsibility, right? We're not autonomous beings. We are called to be part of something. So the kingdom of God expands through where we live. And so we're responsible and here is bummer. There is an accountability to what God's given us. Why? Because... 
He is a giver of gifts, but he has an ultimate call to turn this world into and give this world a saving knowledge of Jesus, and you're all needed for that. It's not just the guy with the mic. It's every single one of us that call the body of Christ home, that profess faith in, in our, 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 our Savior. You see, when we read the story, it says that the, 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 the servant with the one talent, that we, Christendom calls him the unfaithful servant, the servant with the, the one talent, like, well, he wasted it. And, and what I would submit to you is, is, like, he didn't waste the money. He dug a hole and stuck the money in there. What he did is he wasted an opportunity. You see, he wasted an opportunity of what God had equipped him with. Each of you have gifts and talents, and the tension, the tendency, is to stick them in the ground because I don't measure up to that guy. Well, I don't, I'm never going to preach, so what good can I do? A ton. I, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking to find and discover in my conversations men and women who are gifted, who don't see their gifts. Because why? Because they compare themselves up and downhill. I don't, I don't compare, I, I don't, I'm not this shiny, or I don't wear, look this good, or I don't sound this good, or I'm not this articulate, or I'm not this caring, or this, that, and the other, and so I'm going to take my little insignificant thing and stick it in the ground because it doesn't matter. Everything that God gives is good. The smallest to the largest is good, and he has entrusted you with that. And so don't stick it in the ground. Why? Because it's made to grow and be fruitful. Here's the is amazing thing. It's like if I'm the one talent guy, it's like I wish I was at least two talent guy. All that I got to do is take care of the one and turn it into the two and God entrust me with two. It's a progression. It's not a, and it's not like I'm going to promote you to your level of incompetence. It's a kingdom dynamic that God allows us to, 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 to flourish and to succeed. And in our success, we learn the skill sets to now take the next step. Well, I don't want to do any steps. Well, let's refer back. We're made to work. Part of preparation and living is a preparation to realize and to experience greater blessing. But greater blessing doesn't happen unless we are responsible for the blessing that we've received now. Well, I want to go spend $2 and hit 10 million bucks. I can't handle 10 million bucks now. I'd go buy seven trucks and four boats and three houses, and I would be poor. So God, entrust me with what I can handle. Let me prove that I am faithful so that then I can come back and I can be entrusted with a little bit more. You see, what happened with the, f the first guy, the, the one talent guy, was that he was consumed by fear, Scripture tells us. It says, you see, it says when, in verse 24, it says, He also received the one talent, came forward and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and when I hid your talent, and, and I went and hid your talent in the, the ground. Here's what's yours. So he's given back what has been entrusted to him. Didn't do anything with it. Didn't make any strides. Didn't take any risk. Here, it's, it's yours. Just let walk away. What a crime. What a crime. So we end this morning by asking this question. What have you been entrusted with? What has God equipped you to do? If we were all going to share our lives and, 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 and you, you look at our lives as a toolbox, what tools has he given you to accomplish and succeed in the task that he's called you to do? And don't minimize a one of them. Well, all that I can do, you know, I, I just have a heart for people. I just love being with people, but that's kind of stupid. God, no, it's not. Why? Because I don't. <laughs> Can I get an amen? Okay. 
Now, some of you were listening going, did they just say that? I told you, well, I don't have time to tell you that story, but every single one of you have been equipped to do great things and to succeed. And so I'd encourage you this week to go, God, what have you equipped me with? And what you'll un- discover when you look at what you've been equipped with, you will begin to realize the doors that are opening to you because of your equipped, your, your, your talents, the talents that he's entrusted you with. I think of my, my brother Tom in the back, that, that door after door is opening to him in, in, in city leadership and business leaders. Why? Because of the talents that he's been equipped with. And I think if you and I were talked 10 years ago, you would have said, there ain't no way. Right? And yet, being faithful in one thing has opened up opportunities in another. I think Daniel's promotion is a testimony to the gifts that God has equipped him with. The faithfulness of driving around five years ago to all these things and building a business is, it, is, is the faithfulness that was required to God equip him with more so that he has more opportunities and more responsibility. Well, that's a testimony to God's goodness. And I know that he would agree with that. That he would not point to himself and go, hey, look at me, I'm awesome. He would say, God, is, God has blessed me with this opportunity. Each of us have an opportunity to bring God glory. And you have been equipped to do that. Unless you buried it. And so these two questions is where I'd like to end. And I'm going to just pray because Abe's going to get mad at me. (laughs) This week, go before God and write down the dream and the thing that he has placed on your heart. And that's going to take courage that some of you probably have never yet experienced. God, what have you called me to? And put it to pen. And put it on a paper. You don't got to show anybody, but put it on paper. And then, God, what have you equipped me to do? Right? Some of you are artists, and you're going, man, I got this gift. And you're going to start using that gift. That's a God thing. That's success. And so what have you equipped me with? And don't minimize anything because it comes from God and God is a giver of good things. And then allow the Holy Spirit to go, ah, I did bury that. And yet because we are, we serve a good God, the master has not yet come home and asked for an accounting. We can go in the backyard and dig it back up. Right? Just simply because it's in the ground doesn't mean that it's lost. So allow the Holy Spirit to ask, what do I need to dig back up that I've buried? And then have the courage and the humility enough to admit that. Amen? Amen. You are meant to succeed, to bring him glory, to extend the kingdom of God, to change a region. That's you guys. And I'm excited to partner with you. Why don't we stand?